Welcome to the second episode of About Sustainability, a podcast produced by the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, IGES. I'm your host, Andre Mader, Program Director for Biodiversity and Forests at IGES. This time we discussed the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and in particular two key upcoming meetings that review countries' progress toward them. The Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, or APFSD, happening in March 2022, is the main event for the Asia-Pacific region. And the High-Level Political Forum, HLPF, is its global cousin that takes place in July. To find out about these meetings, Aaron, Simon and I spoke with Nobue Amanuma, a Deputy Director at the IGES Integrated Sustainability Centre. She and Simon have been deeply involved in IGES work on the SDGs. We started by talking about what these meetings are and why they are convened. We spent quite a bit of time exploring the concept of VNRs or voluntary national reviews and also the shadow reports or spotlight reports that are key features of the APFSD and HLPF. We discussed IGES involvement at the meetings and asked what else happens beside the review of SDG progress. We talked about the importance of these meetings as forums for engagement between civil society and governments and we ended by speculating about whether they are as effective as they could be. As a side note, keep an eye out for IGES's key messages on the SDGs and other IGES contributions to the APFSD. We'll add links to the show notes for the episode as soon as they're available. So let me start off by asking, what are the APFSD and HLPF? APFSD stands for Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. And HLPF stands for High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. So maybe I think it's better to explain HLPF first. So as people may know, you know, 2030 agenda was adopted and that includes SDGs. And to discuss SDGs or sustainable development in general, there is this international forum uh, hosted by the UN called HLPF. So that's like the the place for global discussion about the SDGs or sustainable development in general. Mm -hmm. But it's a very big platform. So you probably want to have a smaller, more cozy discussion at the regional level. And that's what um, APFSD is about. So it's also an intergovernmental forum, just like uh, HLPF. But it's held in Asia, gathering representatives from Asia-Pacific countries including government people, of course, because it's an intergovernmental forum, but they also invite non-governmental representatives like from civil society. So that's what these two forums are about. Okay, and when you say forum, is it correct to talk about them as, as meetings? They're actual events, they're mm. actual set in time, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. So HLPF is held um, annually in July in New York. And APFSD, because it serves as a regional preparatory meeting to HLPF, it's held a few months earlier than HLPF. And it's usually held in Bangkok at the United Nations SCAP. SCAP stands for Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. And so just for international listeners, uh, HLPF is entirely global, APFSD is for Asia and the Pacific, and then I suppose there are equivalents to APFSD in other regions, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. As uh, Amanuma-san mentioned or explained, those are forums, so, and so I, I, I would say that uh, there are several meetings within each of those forums. Some of them can be bilateral or multilateral between smaller groups that discuss things, and some of them are part of the official program, but there's all sorts of things going on. There's also side events and you know um report launches or book launches and so on so it's sort of just this umbrella happening every year yeah how is this different from the the climate cop or the biodiversity cop is it different if we just take the biodiversity and climate conventions that have their own dedicated conferences of the parties those are um, more than 20 years old, mm. what we, the, the APFSD and the HLPF that are tied to, in this case, the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, they, they came about in 2015. So they're just seven years old and they're different processes. Right. Uh, they're results of different processes. But probably they also 
have some different characteristics as well, which we might we can get into later on. Mm -hmm. Great. You mentioned the SDGs, Simon, and just a question for both or either of you. The main purpose of both of these forums, the HLPF and APFSD, is to review progress on the SDGs. Is that a correct understanding? What they do is, I mean, these two forums do, is to also discuss the status of the progress, and they also review the progress, and they also discuss the way forward. And to do that, they share their own progress through, for example, voluntary national review. Basically, this is a voluntary review of your own country's progress so far. And they also share best practices through that. So it does a lot of things, not just the reviewing. So for the voluntary national review, I understand that not every country is doing a voluntary national review every year, mm. right? So how are these countries, I mean, do they do they say, yes, I will do a review next year? Or how, like, do people actually volunteer? Or is this kind of a scheduled thing? Or um, how does it work? I would say it's a voluntary thing. But I think there is sort of a peer pressure to, <laughs> to do this. Okay. And I think there is also an encouragement from a regional level. For example, APFSD, uh, I mean, prior to the official forum itself, they have this uh, training workshop for those countries that are getting ready to prepare the voluntary national review or present the voluntary national review. So there is always a support and uh, peer learning or peer review process is also encouraged. So there is a soft pressure and sort of an encouragement system in place. That's right. I mean, I think I think um, every year the UN headquarters or UN DESA, that is the UN Department for Economic and Social Affairs in New York, which is sort of a central office in organizing the high-level political forum. And if you go on their website, um, before the high-level political forum, you can see a list of which countries are scheduled to share their voluntary national reviews mm -hmm. and then shortly after the the event in the summer you begin to see over the the next part of the year you begin to see countries that are i guess signing up to present next year and so it is a voluntary process but but uh, as uh, amanuma san has mentioned um i'm sure there's a lot of communication from the regions down to the countries because the regional UN offices will keep a tab on which country has already presented several times and which are yet to present. And those maybe that have been quiet, uh, maybe they contact them and say, hey, um, should we get together to to maybe prepare a review? So I think that's the way it works, but it's voluntary. Mm -hmm. and, and these voluntary national reviews are done just by the government or are there any stakeholder inputs? For SDGs, review is led by the government, national government. But okay. that doesn't mean that they don't involve other stakeholders. In fact, many countries that me and Simon and others have looked at have involved different stakeholders in the process to provide their perspectives, their inputs at the national level because government's understanding of what's going on at the national level might be different from what their country's stakeholders' perspective. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to... Uh, to integrate uh, different views in that uh, voluntary national review. Before we can I get too much into the SDGs, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the the meetings themselves and, and who's involved. So we've mentioned mm -hmm. a few UN agencies uh, and governments have been mentioned now and other stakeholders. But um, just can you kind of give a brief summary of who the organizers are, which UN agencies are important in the process of organizing these meetings and and also Maybe if you can just reiterate, you know, the government's role. Right. So HLPF is uh, held under the auspices of ECOSOC, UN Economic and Social Council. But because sustainable development is such an important issue, they decided to have the HLPF under the auspices of the UN General Assembly every four years. Uh, but when it comes to the technical arrangement, UN DESA, that Simon just mentioned, is a key player to run the meeting. 
And when it comes to APFSD, as I mentioned, ESCAP is the main secretariat. But at the same time, there are so many regional offices of different UN agencies and bodies. So they also come together to support the APFSD. And in fact, um, at HLPF and APFSD, they review different sets of goals every year. And for example, this year they review SDG 4 on education, SDG 5 on gender equality, 14 on life below water, 15 on life on land, and 17 on partnership for the goals. And of course, different UN agency has different expertise. For example, UNESCO would have expertise on education. Uh, UN Women would have expertise on gender. So these agencies, probably at the regional level, they come and join APFSD to provide their expert knowledge and also to share the progress at the regional level. But then the main participants are the governments though, right? Like the, all the, exactly. UN, the UN are basically there for, for support purposes. Yeah, UN colleagues are there to support the process. The main participants are government representatives as well as uh, civil society representatives. Just wanted to add maybe one thing, as you're rightly mentioning, the different organizations and programs that, that are involved Maybe um, those that take center stage tend to change depending on which goals are reviewed uh, each year. Um, but there's also uh, there are also regular progress reports that are put together by in this region. There has been a, an annual progress report done by the UNSCAP together with the United Nations Development Program and the Asian Development Bank. So it's just an example to show that there are also efforts to bring together actors from different constituencies to work on. 2030 agenda to improve coherence. And I mean, that is challenging because it's such a big universe, but uh, that's also, I think, one of the functions of the APFSD to sort of, or of probably as well, uh, the HLPF to bring the different um, agencies and bodies and programs and banks and stakeholders together to exchange and discuss on this. So you mentioned two things, basically, they select specific SDGs to review, but then there's also a more general review. Yeah. Is it a case of countries um, responding individually or summarizing reports that they've already compiled? How does it function? There's an attempt to avoid overlap between regional and global levels. So that means if there is a country or a government that um, in 2022 has to present their uh, voluntary national review at the HLPF, they won't want to present exactly the same thing at the regional level. That would take up uh, a very limited time that there that there are for those meetings. Maybe one thing we haven't mentioned: there's only I think three or four days for the regional meeting, and there's maybe a week or sometimes a little more than a week for the global meetings. And that's not very much to review sometimes 50 countries' progress reports per year. So um, efficiency, I think, is a big consideration. Right. When it comes to voluntary national review at HLPF, each country has about an hour. And what they have to do is basically present their voluntary national review very succinctly. And then they open the floor for questions and answers. Mm -hmm. So questions first are taken from the government representatives and then from non-governmental representatives. And then the presenter responds to these questions. I see. So it's quite interesting how it actually happens because sometimes the government tend to say really nice things about their progress on the SDGs. But then um, the participant, especially from non-governmental sector, they ask very critical questions. And so then as a third person, you have a better understanding of what's going on in within that country. Mm -hmm. Right. That's kind of the review process. So there is that review element that, that takes place at the global level. And, and the preparation for that review element is part of what's happening at the regional level. But Andre, there's, there's many other things that are happening at the same time. You will have a launch of a regional uh, progress report that discusses how um, the region is doing on, on the SDGs. Uh, and then there will be a session dedicated to sharing the results and asking for feedback. So this will be like a, a big room where all government representatives will be. Some uh, countries will send a couple of people from their embassies and other countries will send people from the capital 
uh, that's uh, up to them. And then they will, uh, they can uh, raise their hand and, and make uh, comments or uh, ask questions about what is presented. In this case, a, a report maybe by the UN and others. But then there are other sessions, uh, maybe smaller sessions like roundtables, in which uh, uh, governments and other stakeholders convene in smaller rooms to, based on um, some presentations on what's happening on a particular goal, there will be sort of a more informal discussion uh, on what's, what is going on with this goal. And, and um, you will have some people uh, share good practices about progress and you will have other people share uh, challenges. And I think the important point is to also get the challenges out because making progress on the SDGs is something that every country has uh, challenges with. And then there will be a chair and a, and a rapporteur and they will capture the discussion. And then there's an outcome or a document or a summary produced that is shared just as an example of, of some of the things that are, are going on at the main APFSD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these roundtable discussions are quite interesting because that's where you know government representatives and civil society representatives get together very closely. And they have to, I guess, they have to sit at the same table most of the time. And they have to dis well, they will end up discussing a lot of things in details. And it's quite rare to have that kind of occasions. No, like you come from, for example, a civil society organization in whatever country, and you get to discuss with a government official from another country on the same topic. Mm -hmm. So that's what I like about APFSD. And that's specifically APFSD, or does that happen at HLPF as well, at the global event? I think goal review happened at the global level, but it's not at the same scale as APFSD because APFSD is smaller. So the discussions tend to be more detailed. But at the global level, I think the setting is quite different. There's probably a little more protocol at the global level. And I think the aim is to encourage as much as possible a two-way type of communication between, um, you know, a, let's say a government that presents something and then getting feedback. I think that's sort of part of the purpose, but it's, it's, it is quite difficult because on the one hand, a government ought to be open to some challenging questions. But if you are the one that's asking the challenging questions, for example, if you're representing urban poor or migrant workers, you might have a dire situation in your constituency, the people that you represent. And then you want to bring a concern to the table, but you cannot put them on the spot so much so that it it creates uncomfortable um, confrontations. So it's, it's a bit of a tightrope walk sometimes. Mm. But uh, I think that's also an important function of uh, the APFSD and I think that's that can that's some of the positive impact that that it can have that maybe the general public maybe don't really know but those that are working on specific issues they they do engage and as it was in person I think it it was uh, much better than now it's, everything is taking place online so I think it limits those exchanges. I was actually thinking along the lines of, you know, whether anything was being negotiated at HLPF or APFSD or if it's mostly like a showcasing type of event. I'm still trying to understand like the nature of the event. Mm -hmm. APFSD don't usually negotiate on documents. At HLPF, you tend to see more negotiated documents like ministerial declaration. So basically, leading up to the meeting, the representatives from different countries are negotiating and civil society is providing inputs to the draft text. Mm -hmm. But you can then say negotiated or not. I mean, even at the regional level, when uh, a um, chair's summary is provided, governments are given the opportunity to go into the paragraphs of that draft text. And, and if they disagree with some wording, then they can say that they disagree and, and then it, it, it'll be edited or changed. So, so you can have some kind of negotiation, but as uh, Amanuma-san says, more so at the global level where there is supposed to be a ministerial declaration. But again, none of this is legally binding. It provides some kind of agenda setting, norm setting function. It has that and an exchange of information, but it's, it's not like um, there's anything legally binding about it. It's purely voluntary. So I guess that's kind of goes back to Aaron's questions about the difference between the UNFCCC and Biodiversity Convention. These are legally binding, I would think, but uh, this SDG process or sustainable development discussion is not. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I wanted to just dig in a little bit on VNR, voluntary 
national reviews, right? What, what are they exactly and how did they come about? They are kind of the main document for discussion at these meetings, right? Mm -hmm. So when the global community agreed on the 2030 agenda, they decided that the review should be led by the national governments. And then later they decided that voluntary national review is a mechanism that they agreed to do uh, to look back uh, of the progress of each country and share at the global level. But again, it's a voluntary thing because uh, I think in the discussion about the 2030 agenda, there was a lot of discussion about how this should be monitored. And nobody really wanted to use the, well, I think some country didn't want to use the word monitor because it's too strong. So they, they decided to call it follow-up and review. But as a specific mechanism to do follow-up and review, they decided to do voluntary national review. So a voluntary national review can mean two things. One, I mean, voluntary national review is a report that government prepare. Mm -hmm. Second, voluntary national review is a process of reviewing your country's progress. So when you talk about voluntary national review, you're actually talking about a report itself, but also the process. Okay. And that process is kind of renewed between, uh, or can be renewed between each of these meetings. Is it as frequent as that? So I think one popular way of approaching a voluntary national review is that your country conducts it every four years. Okay. Just like, you know, HLPF is held at the heads of the government level every four years. Your, also, your government also do this reporting every four years. But some countries do it in a different way. They do it every other year. Um, and it, this style is different based on what kind of approach your government takes. If you follow the HLPF style, which is that every year you look at different sets of goals, then you want to probably do it more frequently. But if you want to review all the SDGs from 1 to 17, then you probably don't want to do this all that frequently. So, I mean, also depends on how your government wants to approach. The and review. I guess it takes time and resources to, to review, right? Yeah, exactly. And in the meetings themselves, how frequent are they? Right. Both of them are held annually. Okay. So it's very unlikely that any country will be presenting a new BNR at each of these meetings. Right. That hasn't happened yet. Right. Uh, in the Asia Pacific region, we have one country that has done three VNRs, that's Indonesia, between 2016 and 2021. And then we have uh, more than 20 that have done maybe two. And then uh, maybe around the same number or a little bit less than 20 that have done one. And then there are a few missing. So the VNR reviews all of all 17 of the SDGs, but then the meetings themselves, the APFSD and HLPF meetings, focus on specific goals, right? Right. So you can choose a style. Like I think Indonesia, uh, as Simon mentioned, did it uh, every other year. And their approach is that they review the goals, specific goals that are reviewed by the HL, at the HLPF that year. Uh -huh. I think. But different countries just review the whole SDG 1 through 17 in this uh, voluntary national review. They publish every four years. Okay. So that doesn't go in line with HLPF goals. So that means... Uh, you have a suggested focus that comes from the HLPF basically saying uh, in 2019, we review SDGs 4, 8, 10, 13, 16, 17. In uh, 2017, we review X number of other SDGs. And then there is also a, a guidance to countries on w how is a practical way to prepare the, the VNR process. And, and then many countries follow that. But again, um, if countries have a particular a different uh, preference, then it's also fine. So as Amanuma san mentioned, some countries select to review uh, all the SDGs or even 
add some targets that other countries don't. So it's a diverse process. Mm -hmm. Will IGES be doing anything for this year's APFSD and, uh, and later the HLPF? Can you share any planned activities you know, from IGES or from the Japanese government as well? From IGES, uh, we're supporting the Japanese government side event, which will be on marine plastic litter. And Japanese government is planning to organize this together with French government. And other than that, uh, because the goals reviewed this year include life below water, life on land, which is kind of the topic that I just works on. So we're joining the goal profile roundtable to provide our technical inputs and policy messages. Okay. So that means physically sitting at the table with the government, as you mentioned earlier on. Yeah. But I guess this year, because of the COVID, they're going to have this uh, APFSD in hybrid mode. So, I mean, we won't be there physically, but uh, we'll be, we will be there virtually. And this uh, side event organized by Japan and France is still under consideration by SCAP. So it's not uh, accepted yet. We send the application hoping to get accepted. About side events, I know that like people outside of our workspace will not really understand like the significance of a side event. Why bother? They might ask. So what can you what can you say about that? Why why do we even consider organizing side events? Or why not try to join the main event, so to speak? I mean, the main event is so packed that if you want to say something more technical, more in depth, if you want to present your or showcase your country's initiatives, the most convenient place is side event. So that's the perspective of, of an organizer. From a participant perspective, you're going to have a lot of side events to choose from. It's interesting to expand your interests and find some potential collaborators. So that's why you want to attend side events. That's what I would think as a participant, because it's actually quite interesting, like different uh ideas are presented or different ideas, initiatives, partnership, collaborations are discussed or shared at these side events. So if you find something interesting to you, you just walk in and listen. And if you find some interesting people to work with, then you approach them. Another important function, I guess, is, is also this networking opportunity. And if you aren't in this space, you, you might think correctly, like, side event so what's the main event why should i bother about a side event but in fact the side events is where many uh, of the networking things are happening that are not part of the uh, often quite the uh, packed program as amanuma san says so so many interesting things are happening there so this is a bit of a side road but thinking about again cbd meetings which are the ones i'm most familiar with uh, my impression is that there are typically too many side events and so when you get involved in them, you have to be quite careful you know, because some of them are very poorly attended because there are so many of them. Is that the case at APFSD and HLPF? I think that's a general tendency of all these international meetings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's so many stakeholders and they're working on different things and they always want to present their you know, initiatives. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's usually quite crowded. And there's kind of a tendency, I think, to sort of feel like you've you've done what needed to be done just by holding the side event. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a common challenge, I guess. <laughs> it actually reminds me about, you know, the, the whole idea of accountability. We spoke about the fact that these are not legally binding um, meetings or there's nothing legally binding about these meetings. But I guess that as in other UN meetings and UN type meetings, there is kind of an accountability and Amanuma san you actually mentioned this, you know, the fact that countries kind of want to, you know, show other countries that they're doing something. So I guess there is some accountability there. And just the fact that the event is is happening in the first place, even though they uh, you know, there's a there's a perhaps a temptation to 
to showcase yourself rather than be critical of yourself as a country? Like, is there still some accountability just in the in the fact that the whole thing is happening? Yeah, I think organizing this kind of event makes them participate. By making them participate, they're kind of being vulnerable to criticism by different actors. So I mm. think it's uh, one way of, you know, ensuring accountability. So when I think about this, the role of non-governmental participants is quite critical because as uh, Simon said, when you hear a voluntary national review presentation from countries, sometimes you feel like, oh, that's like a dream destination. Like when I retire, I need to leave this country. But then when you hear the criticism from civil society, you feel like, oh, actually this country might have problem with human rights. Maybe I don't want to go there. So um, so the role of civil society in being critical and also constructive is quite critical to make HLPF more accountable and transparent. Hmm. So that's I think that's what actually the UN is working on. My observation is that every year uh, UN tries to improve the participation of different stakeholders and and increasingly, they're inviting youth representatives to give uh, future generations more voice. So I think these things, uh, these efforts are making HOPF and APFSD more interesting place and more accountable place. Mm-hmm. And I guess also just the fact that an organization from one country can lob a criticism at another country, that actually means quite a lot, right? Because in sort of the less... Um, Less free regimes of the world. Uh, an organization, even if they're in a, in, even if the forum is happening in a different country, they're not going to be uh, criticizing their own government, or they're less likely to be to be doing that. Actually, you find uh, examples of organizations that do not have a connection or an open door to talk to their government at home at the national level about the problems that they are facing, mm. like farmers or others. But then when they go to the regional level, there is a space where they can voice their concerns. Mm. And, you know, maybe they don't do it directly to the government representative because maybe that would be uh, difficult to do, but but it gets voiced. And and so it has um, an indirect sort of um, beneficial role that if you can't say it in one forum, then there will be a space for you to to express your concern. And there are also, um, in parallel to the voluntary national reviews, there are many organizations and countries where civil society produce shadow reports or spotlight reports, Mm. which are parallel uh, reviews of how it's going with either all of the SDGs or particular parts of the Agenda 2030. And so then you get the alternative view. And that's another thing that that this um, process is producing. How common are those? Shadow reports. Is it something that just pops up occasionally, or are there quite uh, quite a lot of them? We are reviewing the VNRs that the region has produced between 2016 and 2021 in a different project right now. And I think that more than half of uh, the VNRs uh, came with a shadow or a spotlight report, a civil society report. Wow. And you know, in some cases in countries that have a more open tradition of collaboration with civil society, the spotlight reports can become an annex to the main voluntary national review. Or in some cases, even the, the civil society are asked to produce sections of the voluntary national review. So there are many different ways to do this. Mm. And we also find that countries that produce more than one VNR, the second VNR and, and now the third VNR, you tend to see a deeper engagement with the material, with the SDGs. Mm. So actually, the exercise seems to have some benefit. Mm. Yeah, I also agree. I mean... When I look at some particular countries of uh, voluntary national review reports and the shadow reports, both of them are improving every time they do. Mm. So, yeah, so I think this system is also working. And another thing about HLPF and APFSD is that, as Simon said, you see different countries' approaches to stakeholder engagement. So you can learn from that and think about what is a better way forward for my own country's situation right? Uh, from the perspective of civil society or from the government. Erin, do you want to jump in with? Yeah, yeah. So, so I just had a question about the comment earlier on how stakeholders are able to find a place to voice their concerns at these platforms. I understand that with COVID, um, at least with the UNFCCC Climate COP, 
there were a lot of concerns about it potentially being held online and therefore um, not having the like having kind of an asymmetrical participation. I'm just wondering if there were any impacts like that in the last two years that you know of that have led to maybe reduced or changed uh, participation of stakeholders at um, APFSD or HLPF. It is it is just difficult. Even when you have hybrid meetings, it's usually the national stakeholders. I mean, the people that are in the same country where the event is held, they, they might be able to attend in person. Everybody else joins online. In one way, it has flattened the playing field a little bit because, um, let's say, um, youth or uh, people in research institutes, people like ourselves, we might be quite used to uh, engaging with YouTube and social media and and uh, Zoom or various uh, conference platforms. And then you have uh, government representatives that are joining the same Zoom meeting, but we might be more fluent in using it. And then at the same time, we are just another participant. So if we are bold, we might go in and be able to prepare a quite punchy statement, whereas the government uh, representative may be uh, a bit more constrained. So it has provided some positive changes, but that is only if you have a good internet connection. So if you're sitting in some village mm. in the countryside of a country in the region or in a different time zone in the Pacific, you might have a very hard time to participate. How well do you think that APFSD and HLPF are working? I think you've, you've both covered this to some extent, but as a, as a whole, would you say that they're fulfilling an important purpose or do you think that there are fundamental changes that could be made to make them work better? I, so I think they're doing a good job to some extent, but I think there is always a room for improvement. Uh, when it comes to, for example, APFSD, they're serving as a preparatory meeting to HLPF mm -hmm. and they're providing a lot of support to member countries. So in a sense, I think they're doing a great job, but at the same time, not sure how much regional perspectives discussed at APFSD is reflected at the global discussion at HLPF. So in that connection, I think there may be a room for improvement or making it more obvious. Mm -hmm. If you think about HLPF's role as like a place to accelerate the progress towards the achievement of the 2030 agenda, I think the road is quite tough. The way ahead is quite tough, partly because of COVID and many other challenges that we face. We're quite far away from achieving the 2030 agenda. I mean, of course, HLPF has been serving as a really nice platform for you know, sharing best practices and, you know, reviewing the progress and so on. But they need to do more to help the world achieve the 2030 agenda. So in that sense, there are so many things that we need to work on, including strengthening the accountability of voluntary national review, which might include bringing in more different voices or not, I don't know. And also maybe looking at the review mechanism that we have, Voluntary National Review. And I mean, there, there are just so many more things that we need to do, mm -hmm. um, both about the HLPF, but also about different aspects of the sustainable development implementation and review. Yeah, I think we are very far from achieving the SDGs. And if we're supposed to achieve them by 2030, we are nowhere close to that. So I think the review function needs to be strengthened. I'm not sure in what way, but it's not enough for countries to just report on what they're doing. That's just a reporting. That's good for transparency. But the next step would be to add some elements of review, maybe even peer review. You could have some countries help each other or reviewing each other so that it's not one UN body that's reviewing others, but maybe countries could help each other. That maybe one. So yeah, so the challenge is that I mean the review doesn't lead to strengthened implementation, right? Well, not not necessarily, right? Right. 
And looking at the progress so far, uh, we will probably agree that no matter how well you review your progress, it doesn't mean that you can strengthen your implementation. So, I mean, the review itself needs to be strengthened, but the link between review and implementation also needs to be strengthened. Mm. So in the context of the Convention on Biological Diversity, there are two important sort of mechanisms. One is a national report, which is similar to the BNR, and then the other one is a national biodiversity strategy and action plan. And that's basically, that's an expression of what you're planning to do. So I guess the, this process doesn't have something like that, right? It doesn't have a planning document. It only has a, an assessment document. In terms of the SDGs, each country has a different approach, but I think it's quite common for national governments to develop national strategy or national action plan. In the case of Japan, they have both. So I guess in a, in a way, SDG implementation review mechanism and uh, practical steps is quite similar to other processes in biodiversity, for example, as you mentioned. But even with these action plans and strategies, it's still difficult because I think um, SDG is basically, I mean, it, it encompasses everything not just environmental issues, but also economic and social. And it, it has to address systemic issues, which is quite difficult politically sometimes. So making a huge progress requires, in my opinion, a systemic change, which requires really courageous, honest discussions among different stakeholders. And I think it's probably quite challenging and it's, troublesome <laughs> and it takes a lot of time and cost and all of that so it's I mean, maybe that's why it's difficult mm. but that doesn't mean that there isn't a way forward i guess our role is to find out what can be done realistically given the constraints mm. 